themselves, themselves thrive, but also the teachers learn. And for me, for example, as a Muslim um, female, there are many spaces where I'm usually the only one. And so the issue of representation is, not, is lacking, but then I need to lean on other strong women and see how they're gonna you know, pave a path for myself or for my daughters or for other women who represent a different culture that's different than theirs. And how are they able to make that safe space for them to build them up and also give them that confidence for them to really thrive in that classroom? Um, there's a bill moving through the Tennessee legislature currently that would allow a rapist's family to sue the rape victim if she gets an abortion. Yeah, it's 2022. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about this topic of women, the freedom women have to make their own decisions. Where are we on that? at the moment. Myra, you can take that one, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, definitely a big question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, uh, you know, so I've been working on promoting gender equality for, as I said, for the past 20 years. So I, I like to be optimistic about, you know, progress being made. Uh, the last panel that I was on, I was actually in the Middle East in Dubai um, talking about gender norms and how that influences um, women's access to health care. And so the fact that we were even having that discussion, um, you know, on such an open panel with men uh, and, and talking about things like rape, um, which, you know, definitely taboo, but uh, and that, that was funded by a, a private for-profit company. I think that's progress. Um, at the same time, we have seen a lot of backlash over uh, these past uh, few years and, and probably decade. And, I think um, law that's being put forward is one a prime example of that, and we see, you know, from the global trends and the data that there's definitely, you know, been a plateauing of uh, progress and change in terms of advancing women's leadership, in terms of social norms, in terms of, um, you know, kind of the laws and the investments in um, promoting women's rights and equality. Um, but I, I think, and um, to quote from an Afghan proverb drop by drop, a river is made. But Judy, what, what do women, how do women fight back to preserve the rights they have? Um, what do they do? What do women do? Well, I, I think that um, the most important lesson, and, and certainly we can look back even, our historical, how did women get the right to vote? How did they get some of the rights that we've had that many of us take for granted nowadays? is that they, it was collective power. It's women joining with other women and other men to stand up and join together and to, to try to make a difference, to say no. If a, if, a, if a dumb law is trying to be passed, that we need to stand up. And we need to support those who are in Tennessee and, and trying to help them not pass such a law. Um, and, and or then look at down the road of getting those representatives out of office. So it's all about collective power. It's all about making sure that people understand that their vote makes a difference. I'm gonna say that again. Your vote makes a difference. In some areas, it is so, I mean, there, some, some um, battles have been won by very slim minorities of votes, right? And so I think that we need to really think about um, the vote as one thing, but also then standing up as a group. And I think that it's been, especially with reproductive rights and, and the attack on abortion, I think has been um, a, 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 that w young women in particular just took it for granted, took it for granted that this was okay and this is what, we, and we don't, you know, feminism is dead. We don't need to talk about feminism anymore. We don't, and it's not that being a feminist means that we are better than, it means that we're just looking for it to be equal to and be able to join with and to partner with. and so. Um, I, it, so, I, again, it's that collective action of getting people to work together, all, all ages, all, all genders, all um, uh, minor, uh, ethnicities and races, and I mean, we could just keep going down this list to have people join together. And, you know, one of the questions I think people, maybe in, younger people too, ask is why is this happening? Why is this happening? I mean, you think that, oh, you know, we've progressed to a certain point, we have more diversity in the boardroom. We've got, 
you know, women with more power, more powerful jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, we have this pressure that is trying to shrink back to a more submissive role, really. I mean, come on. I mean, that's what some of this is, what it's about. Why is this happening? Power. I think uh, a good example is when we had the past presidency and when they interviewed women who voted. And it's not so much that they voted for the fact that they believed in his policies or what have you, but they were also part of the status quo. So I think it's very important for people who are in those powers, and we're talking about women, who are there for other women regardless of, like you said, ethnicity or background. Because although we do have the heterosexual male who's in power, there are a lot of other women behind them who are also supporting it, and as we say, keeping the fort down. So it's very important when we as a collective, as women, come together to make sure that we make that change, regardless of the pushback that we get. And unfortunately, those heterosexual males who are holding that power are also holding you know, spaces and markers for the women in their lives because they're allowed to do so. So I think that's another piece and another layer to it that needs to be discussed. We have to talk about COVID because the impact's been pretty severe, uh, especially on women. Am I right? How about in the classroom? This is a really big deal, actually. COVID, COVID wasn't that big a deal. No. <laughs> um, COVID has dramatically changed the way I show up everywhere, and certainly in the classroom. And so I think when we, when, when we think about what happened with our students, so the school that I teach in, um, is about 89% black students, six, six to seven percent Hispanic Latinx students, right? So the majority of my students represent marginalized communities. And when we look at like just data of what happened with students during the pandemic, 144,000 children lost a primary or secondary caregiver during the pandemic, right? So that's a huge number of students. What we also know is that the, the people who were most affected by COVID were black and brown communities, right? The marginalized communities, the communities of disenfranchisement. So what that looks like in the classroom, the impact has just been phenomenal. And I think the first thing that I've seen with all students, but especially with girls, is the severe mental health challenges that have now shown up in classrooms. And unfortunately, school systems just are not equipped to handle the mental health needs that our students are presenting with. There's not nearly enough school counselors. There's not nearly enough psychologists. So students are showing up to school with so much trauma, just unresolved trauma, and girls in particular. And if any of you have ever had a middle school girl in your home, you know what that is like to have a middle school girl in your home, right? And so layering what that already looks like, the trauma of raising a middle school child, layering that on to layering the pandemic on top of that and, and significant loss, and not just loss of a family member or friend, but this loss of, of, of socialization, right? The loss of friendship, the loss of connection, and then attempting to re-socialize those students back into a school. We can't even focus on what on academics, right, or skill development. It's just about like, are you whole when you show up here? Like, how is your heart when you show up into a school building? Because our students are just coming with so much on their heart. So the trauma is just over, it's overwhelming as an educator and especially on girls in particular. And how, so how do we address that? I mean, what, in your, in your, where, Towson High School? Towson High School? So you, were you, Remote last year? I was remote last year, yes. So I was fully virtual until I had about a month at the end of the year where I was in person in cohorts. So, I mean, it was less than half of the school that would be back at a time. Now, you're older, obviously. You're, you know, it's now a senior, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the impact of it? The impact, um, 
Can you restate the question, well, please? <laughs> I mean, the impact of, it's, first of all, it's a socialization impact. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's an educational impact. And, you know, what do you feel you lost? Do you feel like you lost yeah. a year? I do. I feel like I've lost like two years. Um, I think last year when we were virtual, I think there was a big um, loss of actually learning. Um, when we were virtual, I mean, almost everyone had their cameras off. There wasn't a, a rule to have your camera on. Teachers were like staring into a void on their computers. Um, and I think attendance dropped a lot and people's motivation dropped a lot. I mean, just sitting at your house and trying to focus, I think, was very difficult last year for everyone. Um, I can only speak for myself, but I think last year was, was very difficult in that sense. And I would totally agree with what Brianna said about the re-socializing back into school has been much more difficult than I have anticipated. And that idea of um, that's, that putting that idea of re-socialization re is the, the main thing on your mind, being back in the building. Um, and learning is definitely, I think, harder this year. Really? Yeah. Even in person? In person. I think like reacclimating back into being in the classroom again after so long and around people and having, I had a semesterized schedule last year, which was a decision the school made um, be, to, to make the workload smaller for the students and for the teachers. So they were only teaching four classes at once instead of eight. Um, and I think it's definitely been a lot this year to add back on those extra classes, that experience of being in school and having to get adjusted to that again. So how do we overcome the, how do we, how do we repair the damage of, of, of this really, um, really a two year period of an interruption of ev just everything about everybody's life? How do you repair the damage? So I think one of the, I think COVID was um, a major curse for education because Whatever the disparities were prior to COVID, COVID blew it over, you know, blew the lid over, you know, wide open. Um, whatever disparities there were before are even worse now. I think what needs to happen is education in general is at a tipping point. And if we don't do investment in time, in teachers, in resources, we're going to have a generation of students who lack uh, the skills, who lack the socialization, and we're going to have a generation of students who really are lost. And as we see a lot of, they're calling it the year of the great resignation. Teachers especially are not being looked at as the main resource who are really holding these schools down, who are there day to day, who are dealing with their own issues. And we are not going, we're not using them as our main resource and we're not listening to them. But also we need more funding for that as well. Yeah, go ahead. If you're finished? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think to add to that, I think that we do also need to invest in the care economy. Um, and that's mostly women, you know, that have um, really bo bear, borne the burden <laughs> of, of um, COVID. And, you know, we know that it's, it's even just in the health workforce, which I, I work in, it's 90% is made up of women once you count the unpaid care work of women at home and in their communities um, and we're not investing in that and actually uh, my colleagues just put out a paper in science that did an analysis of the social protection investments um, during um, COVID or to respond to COVID and less than 20 percent of them actually took this kind of gender responsive approach that invested in the care economy and um, how do, how do we adjust education? So back to your point about, well, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, one of the disparities that existed well before is there's a, a gender financial equality disparity as well. I mean, um, the World Economic Forum in 2020 put out a report that said at the current pace, it's gonna take women 257 years to catch up to men economically. That's globally. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm, fortunate to be a part of an initiative that we're working on at PNC called Project 257, but it goes to the, the four pillars of why women are at a disadvantage. One is 
the, they have much more unpaid domestic work than their male peers, which definitely came out during the pandemic and was a reason why a lot of women dropped out of the, of the workforce because they couldn't get the care for their children or their parents. Um, the other is that they are more, they are underrepresented in high paying fields. Um, their women tend to be in more administrative and other roles that are more likely to get um, uh, displaced by technology. And just general pay disparity, women are still paid in the same roles less than men. Um, and it, there's just, and I'm blanking on the fourth disparity um, at the moment, but it, I think it, you know, it, give, it gives you very much a feel for that, yes, the disparities still exist, and COVID not, did not help it. Um, more women than men dropped out, and if you saw, if you are part of a two-career family who was also homeschooling your children, you understood the strain that these folks were under. So what do you, how do you, how do you repair it? <laughs> uh, as a dean of school of social work, you hire more social workers. <laughs> <laughs> right, well I was gonna say. <laughs> I mean, I think that... I said to Judy before I started, I said, Judy, I could have a two-hour conversation with you about the city of Baltimore and, you know, kind of the... Yeah. All the needs of reaching folks in the city of Baltimore. I mean, you know? the, the trauma, the loss is, is the students have felt it, the teachers have felt it, um, the workforce has felt it. They, I mean, we could just keep going down this list. I think about, um, I mean, the behavioral health challenges and the mental health challenges have just skyrocketed with kids with young adults, with adults, with older adults. I mean, the isolation that some people experienced in the last two years. You know, of, of those of you that, you know, either went through COVID on your own, in your own home, or knew somebody who did that. It was very difficult for those individuals to do so. And if you had any health issues, it made it even more complicated. And so anxiety, depression, PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder just skyrocketed. And, and I think that this is gonna be there's a lot of work to do in the educational uh, field, but I think even in the behavioral health field, we're gonna, we're gonna need more social workers, more counselors, more therapists, more people who are paying attention to the trauma and not thinking of trauma as, you know, it's some violence that happened, but the trauma of loss, the trauma of, of unfulfilled promises. I mean, we could, we could keep going with what this means. Um, and then, and having somebody being able to help individuals Deal, and groups and organizations and society deal with all of these things. Um, Laura, you mentioned the, um, the financial disparities. There's also a deepening poverty rate in many ways. And a couple of you are kind of that's your specialty, am I correct? Ellie, I mean, is it right? Go ahead. Check. All right, there we go. Um, so yes, I'm. I would like to talk about period poverty a little bit. So, um, so period poverty or menstrual inequity is the lack of access to safe and affordable menstrual products. Um, it has a lot of uh, big consequences on mental and physical health. Many of uh, people who menstruate have to turn to. Um, alternatives to period products that can cause a lot of um, bad uh, health effects and it can also lead to absenteeism not having access to these essential products can mean uh, staying home from school or work or I mean changing your everyday life and all the, the those things and activities that you do throughout the day it's because, I mean, there's, there's a huge stigma uh, around periods and period poverty, which means that it's an issue that's not talked about a lot. Um, I, I personally didn't really know about menstrual inequity at all until the pandemic started. Um, period products are really expensive. Um, in a, most of the states in the US, they're taxed as a luxury item, which I'm sure anyone who Wow. has a period or knows someone who has a period, which is everybody, um, knows that it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Um, but you didn't know that. Yeah, so 
So it's a huge issue, which people don't know about. Um, I didn't know about until, until the pandemic, which is when, um, when, when schools closed down, a lot of, of students had access to period products through their schools. So specifically, the Student Support Network is an organization that provides school supplies, food, um, and other items like that, toiletries, uh, to Baltimore County Public Schools. And they have these like comfort closets, which is what they call them, in the schools that have access to these supplies and period products was part of that. And, and students also get period products from the nurse and other places in their school. And so when schools shut down, that was a, a major thing. Um, of course, period poverty was something that was going on far before the pandemic, but I think that that, that was what opened my eyes to it. Um, and so I took on the Period Poverty Project which I'm a co-chair of, and we facilitated the distribution of 300 to 800 period packs a week through these weekly uh, student support network drives. Each pack has tampons, pads, panty liners, things um, to last one full menstrual cycle. So we had donors who would donate money or through like an Amazon wish list, the products, and then we had a group of, um, by the end, about 40 volunteers who would create and assemble and drop back off the packs each week to then be distributed um, to Baltimore County Public School families, not just the students, but family members, mothers, um, all people who menstruate in the Baltimore County Public School community. Um, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, really. Gloria Steinem once said, if men menstruated, we'd have a national holiday every 28 days. <laughs> and then it wouldn't be a luxury product. Yes, that's true. <laughs> a, a really phenomenal um, effort, though. Thank you. And, you know, to really do something you don't think about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, Brianna, you probably know this, too, because your students were being, when school closed, it was an institution that closed. It was an anchor in the lives of many kids. Am I right? Absolutely. First of all, I just want to say that's, that's what a real Baltimore County student is. That's <laughs> shout out to Baltimore County students. Thank you. Ellie, that is amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, and she is absolutely right. I think the, la the, I don't think we understood how schools are truly sent, like resource centers and centers for the community. And so one of the things I remember the beginning of the pandemic, um, when we first shut down and there was these like this kind of little cushiony two weeks, which actually was we write about now, this cushiony two weeks where like teachers were home and not actually doing anything because we just, no one knew what kind of was going on and we thought it was literally going to be two weeks. And I remember getting a message from one of my, from one of my students and she's like, Miss Ross, can you, can you call me? And so I call her and she called me and she's crying because she was in an abusive household. And so thinking about the fact that when the pandemic happened and when we shut down schools for me, which was like a nice two weeks to kind of just be home and clean my house and like water my plants for the first time, for many of our students was re literally removing them from a lifeline. So it's not just about they come to school and they learn. It's also where I get two good meals a day. And it's also where I see that teacher who's gonna tell me that she loves me every single morning. And it's where I'm gonna go to the nurse and get pads when I started my period because I don't have any. And it's where I can see the, where I, I see every week, I see my guidance counselor and I meet with her and we check, we check in with about what's going on, right? And so schools were really these, these centers of, of the community, these resource centers. And then we also then sent our students, many of them into homes where they may be neglected or they're now in, in homes 24 hours a day with their abusers or with the people who, are, who might not be treating them the way we would ideally like for our students to be treated. And so the pandemic absolutely put, just like, like Abir said, the, the barriers and um, the inequity that existed was unbelievably exacerbated by that shutdown and having to put, take students out of these school communities that were very, very much like heartbeats for them. So what are, go, somebody go to yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add another layer to that when we're talking about, say, refugee students or students of, um, of immigrants whose parents, you know, education is a beacon for them. And, you know, they come here for the education. They come here because it's, it's, a, it's a doorway to a better life. And what Brianna was saying and, you know, Ellie's saying about the fact that it was not just that resource center, it was also structure for them. And it was a place for them to develop their skills. And then when schools did close, 
The disparities also for kids who are refugees or immigrants was even tenfold because they didn't have those resources that they need. And they, you know, whatever they were getting in the school now, they were totally lost without it. And they also, whatever students have lost in the last two years, I think students who are of immigrant origin or refugees have lost more because there's still a lot of makeup that they have to do and a lot of skills lost. But also parents were devastated thinking their students and their children are losing these opportunities that were offered to them through the schools. So that also, you know, blew the lid off for parents who are new to, or who are newcomers to here, their children are newcomers as well. And I think you cannot underestimate the, and Brianna, you said the 144,000 children who lost, you know, parents, caregivers, et cetera. And then the, just the enormous disruption to people losing jobs, unable to work because of COVID, unable, because they're sick, they can't work. I mean, it's just, it's been a, you know, I, I mean, just, I think we are 20 years from now we'll be able to see this you know enormous impact of the last couple of years. So we've talked a lot about the negative of all of this but you know so in 2022 what is there to celebrate for women? Um, I this is a big celebration um, in my opinion uh, but <laughs> um, so I had the opportunity to provide testimony for a bill um, that was passed and will go into law in um, October of 2020, so this coming fall, that will make all um, Maryland public high schools and middle schools have at least one girl's bathroom for high schools that's a boy's bathroom as well. Um, have free period products in those bathrooms, which is a huge step. Um, and I think, yeah. So that's that's definitely one thing to celebrate. It doesn't fix anything. Um, well, I fix think, something, but sure. it, yes, it does. It's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge resource. I think what we've seen in a lot of the communities where we have students who are, whether they're newcomers or refugees, um, they've taken to the concept of civic action to heart and the concept of citizenship to heart, and it's beautiful to see students who sit there and say, you know, I'm 16, I can't vote, but I'm definitely going to mobilize and, you know, just like Ellie with the period products and other resources that they want to give to their own communities where they've been out and helping people, whether they're people who, don't, um, who need translation services, whether they're people who need services just going to and from because now they picked up on the system, they've actually stepped to the, up to the plate. So whenever we say, oh, this generation, we wag our finger, Really, they're doing some amazing things, and we really have to commend them for stepping up and taking action for that one. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely been, as I said, some some difficult feeling setbacks, but I, I again, want to focus on some of the positive. Um, and I think, you know, with the pandemic, there was a, a lot of emphasis and highlight on the, the shadow pandemic and the spikes in, in violence against women and for my work, because um, I actually work on that as a health issue um, in developing countries that actually brought attention to it, um, it uh, uh, to a problem that has always been there, um, you know, that one in three women around the world have experienced, um, and in some places as high as 70%, um, but because there was much more dialogue and bringing forth this idea that you know, women are stuck at home and being forced to stay in these violent situations, um, we, we did see some, you know, at least increased attention to it, if not the adequate alignment of investment. Um, I would say that in terms from an education standpoint, the, the students of this generation, the children of this generation, the children of the pandemic are the most resilient humans on this planet right now. I don't know what, I can't imagine what it would be like to live and be to live and learn through this and so i think one of the things that i've seen beyond the phenomenal students like ellie who were doing this civic action um, and i've gotten to talk to lots of other students who were doing that same thing organizing and mobilizing and seeing these problems and being like somebody has to do something and feeling like they need to be the ones to do it i think there's the we're also, we've born a generation of students who are much, much more compassionate because they understand grief and they understand trauma and they understand loss. And so what I think we'll see, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot to repair and I think there's a lot that needs to be restored. But what I am really excited about is seeing students like Ellie and other students um, who have just a different sense 
for, for, of themselves and of each other. And so in talking to some high school students recently, one of the things they shared was that like when they sit down at lunch, they just check in, like, how are you? How are you feeling? Like, how's your mental health? How's your mind and how's your spirit? And like, what a beautiful thing. I was not doing that in high school. And so I think we'll, we, because of this, we will, we will bear a much, much beautiful, a much more beautiful generation of humans who are compassionate for one another. And some of these things that we're talking about, these issues that are facing women, right, will not exist because they will have a different understanding of how to treat other people with kindness and compassion. So I'm really excited to see that. As much as the pandemic has been so troubling, this resilient group of humans are going to do just beautiful things for us and for this world. I wanted to quickly say that I've I've noticed that that increase in like compassion and empathy and just I think people are much more um, going out of their way to check in with each other and and see how each other are doing and and do what they can do to help the people around them especially in schools with teenagers yeah no I think from a workforce perspective you know one people realize now you know that child care and early childhood education plays such an enormous role in enabling women to fully participate in the workforce. And men. Yes. Right. And, and however more of that care tends to fall on women than on men. Right. Absolutely. Um, right. But the, the knowledge of that and how essential it is and how it has not always been treated as such um, and you know, the plight of the early child care worker and that fact that they are not paid nearly enough. So I think it's called a lot of attention to that. And on the other side, remote work has opened up possibilities for people to be able to manage their lives uh, a little more um, graciously. It's still very unequal, and there's a lot of essential jobs that don't have that capability. So there's very much a divide there. But I do think people are more aware of you know, what, what we are lacking to get women fully represented in the workforce and how important, frankly, it would be to our economy if we could get women fully represented. I was going to add, similar to the workforce, um, for women having the flexibility to maybe work a few days from home where they can help with the kids or do other chores and not feel like, because they, they're going to be working nights anyway, and I mean, I think that they're some level of flexibility. I also think, you know, I'm looking forward to, what do we call them pandemic children? I was already called a pandemic dean, which is kind of a hard term. To, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm hoping that they will, they will grow up and become social workers and will have that sensitivity and that, that thoughtfulness and that wanting to help others uh, make a difference, whether it's with the individual, the family, or at a larger policy level. Um, I think that um, I took this job as dean and in July of 2020, in the you know, middle of pandemic, I was, did a, what they call a job talk where I come on campus and talk about what I do and you know, my vision for the school, and that was the end of February of 2020, right before the pandemic. And I remember in that job talk, I was saying, one, we need to be thinking way more about online education as a, as a graduate school of social work, and two, we need to be training our social workers in how to do telehealth. Mm, right. <laughs> <laughs> so right. the pandemic has helped yep. us move as a school in that direction. But the one thing about telehealth that I've learned um, from a lot of social workers who are continuing to do telehealth work even after their practices have opened up is this notion that for some families it is way easier to get on a phone to get on a Zoom call than it is to drive, yep. find parking, Park. get right. into the office, and, and do it nine to five Monday through Friday. So I think this is really going to make mental health services and counseling services way more um, accessible and easier to do and people and maybe the stigma will then decrease because they can do it in their own homes. That'd be great. Um, we have a few minutes. Um, are there any questions from the audience? There are no dumb questions. <laughs> Look, looking back at the effect on students of closing the schools, would we have been better off to never have shut down and just accept that more people are going to get sick and die from COVID 
that that would be less disruptive than, than what we did. Okay, well that question could be answered in like three hour conversation. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's the question of the year, you know? I, I wanna see the LAP market. <laughs> No, I think we needed to shut down schools. Um, I think that what I've seen, I can just give you an example just from this past December, um, when we were kind of at that little surge sort of point right before the holidays, and we had, I have a building of about 1,600 students, it's a very large middle school, and I would say there was a, a place, and let's say I have 100 teachers, there was, what we were getting around Christmas and there were days when we were having 20 teachers out at a time because they have COVID. Mm -hmm. And we're having hundreds of groups of students who are either, who have either tested positive or are now quarantined because they've been exposed. And that is a, that was a much greater disruption to learning than having been virtual. I wasn't a huge fan of virtual learning, right? But it did at least allow, because what never happened was schools never closed. Schools always stayed open. The physical school buildings were not, right? They, those weren't the centers for learning, but education was always happening. And so um, I'm glad that we prioritize in, in Maryland and across the country that we prioritize the health and safety of our students and families first. Ellie, you want to just answer that? I part? would agree with that. I think, um, I think it is more of an issue of the way that we, we handled virtual learning and getting back into schools than it was with, with shutting down. Because I think, like, like you said, um, it was necessary um, for the health of, of the students, the teachers, families, everyone. Well, it's not exactly like the certain institutions weren't at all ready to go vert, you know, mobile. I mean, in my business, I mean, I walked out of our newsroom on March 9th or whatever it was, 2020, you know, to go do a live shot about something related to what was at that point developing, thinking, oh, I'll be back, you know. And then I wasn't, I just went back this week, really, for the, I mean, I've been back a little bit, but more regularly, you know. I mean, this is a long time. <laughs> and, um, I, but we are, we already work, have the laptop, we have VPN licenses, we, are, we, we work in the field. So it was really no big deal for us, but for institutions like schools and, you know, people, Banks, sure, where you're used to in-person. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's different. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I realize that tonight is a conversation about women and girls, <clears throat> but I do have a question, um, especially for those of you who are graduating and are in education. I was so interested in your comments about feeling that the COVID, these COVID kids are going to be more compassionate and I'm wondering if you have the same optimism about the boys in your classroom. Uh, do, you, do you think the boys are sitting around checking in with one another or are they, are they moving through this period in a very different way? A good because I, I don't think we move <laughs> forward. We're not in silos, you know, and, um, and I do think that how, how the boys transition through this is going to be a hugely impactful. I mean, I, I have a seven-year-old, almost eight-year-old grandson, and I, I think about him every night um, and how he has struggled, um, deeply struggled with this. And, um, and I wonder about, about how they're going to work together and would love your responses, please. Um, that's a really interesting question and one for me to perseverate on a little bit. Um, I have a, a 10 year old nephew who also really struggled during COVID. He had a very, very difficult, a very, very difficult time. Um, and I will admittedly say that the two students who I talked to about this uh, just a few weeks ago, they both happened to be young girls, where they talked about this space around checking in. Um, I can say that what I'm seeing in my school in particular, there certainly is, girls certainly are having these conversations, but what I do see from boys is like a different, there's a different level of compassion around people. Now, I can't say that it's specific to mental health, right, that they are also at the cafeteria, like, how's your heart, right? Like, I don't know if the boys are really doing that, but what I have seen, um, especially, like, I teach sixth grade, so um, sixth grade boys are a different, that's a whole different, like, 
right? Thank you for the laughs, because like y'all know, that means you have us, you've had a sixth grade boy in your home, right? So sixth grade boys are special. And um, what I have seen from my sixth grade boys, and I'll say specifically around um, sexuality, has I've seen a much, much, a, a, just a deeper understanding and like a different level of compassion. And I think one of the reasons why like this year in particular, there's been a significant increase in mental health visits in adolescents, like 12 to seven, ages 12 to 17. So there's about a, been about a 33% increase in students who are seeing these, having these mental health challenges. And I think because all the students are seeing this, right, even if I'm not experiencing it personally, it's very likely that I know someone who maybe has like been, has been dealing with self-harm or who is having suicidal ideation. And I think that piece, I don't think they're having, the boys are having the conversation, but I think they're seeing it. And I think it's making them a lot more compassionate. And I said around sexuality in specific because um, we have a lot of students in my school who are, who are figuring out and understanding what their sexual identity is um, and, you know, figuring out their gender pronouns and that kind of thing. And the boys have been a lot, and even teachers in my school who are doing that too. And I've seen what I would typically see is the boys be really silly about it. There's a, there's a lot less of that. And I've even seen them call each other out on it, right? Like, so I had, there's a teacher in my school who um, their pronoun is, they go by they, them, and their pronoun um, is mix, M-X. And a student called her the wrong, they called this teacher the wrong pronoun. And another student, it was a boy, like, no, that, that's not that's not their name. That's mix, that, that, that's mix, right? And so I've seen them just take up for that a little bit differently because I think they're seeing firsthand the effects of how people are ha have been impacted and affected and the mental health challenges that people are having. I was just putting my mic down because I, I think you got that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, there we go. I, too, am a, a woman in the workforce who was there when it was not okay to wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I marched in ERA um, parades and that sort of thing. And it's just strikes me as crazy that we're still having these conversations today. Um, and I would like to know if you have a good one-liner or good, some way to cut off somebody who's talking about how feminists ruined it for us. I had a nephew whose girlfriend said this recently where she said she wanted to stay home with kids and feminists ruined it. And I was like, so um, I know it's a long conversation, and I could take her through chapter and verse of my own career, but I'm just wondering what this esteemed group of women here tonight would, would offer to her. Thank you. I think for me, you know, feminism takes on a different role based on your own lived experience as well. Um, I think for years and decades, feminism has had the epitome of maybe just, you know, uh, something that only white women believed in, or, you know, you have the total opposite of, you know, when um, the black power movement and then the total opposite with that. But really feminism takes on its own persona based on who you are as well. So if a person wants to do something that they identify as a female, I think that is something that she can identify as feminism. I think it's really morphed into different ideas People can look at me and say I am totally anti-feminist, right, with the way that I dress. Where for me personally, I think it's the opposite. I think I'm empowering myself with the way I dress and how I go into a room and represent myself. So I think feminism, the one-liner could be, what does it mean to you? But how are you also helping uplift your sisters with your concept of feminism as well? I think my response would be, how good for you that you have that choice. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Exactly right. It's about being able to do what you want to do. I always think back to my mother who said, when I was going off to college, she said, you, you can study anything. She said, I had two choices. I could either be a teacher or a nurse. Yep. And exactly she got pushed right. into being a nurse because her older sister was a nurse. She, I think she secretly always wanted to be a phys ed teacher, and she was always a little bit bitter about that. <laughs> um, but, but that, to me, it's not, a, not about dictating women's choices, yeah. but having the freedom to, to make your own choices. So that, that's my, my take on it. Yeah. I, I think it's it. Best answer. 
I think it's important for people to know, and I think it's something that um, more people are, th I think the definition of feminism is changing, and I think that um, it's important to, to understand that, that true feminism isn't about any one way of being a woman. It's about all women, trans women, women of color, uh, all women and all of the different experiences of being a woman and that, I that idea of choice. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody. It's a great evening, you know? <laughs> I'm at that um, moment in my life, I just received a Lifetime Achievement Award um, uh, last week, and it was a humbling evening because it's like the bell goes off. You don't get a Lifetime Achievement Award at the age of 30. Um, so it, it really is to, re and this is maybe do this tonight, is to reflect on where you start. My first job in television, again, I was the first full-time woman, $75 a week in 1976, and that would be $19,000 today, which is not a lot of money. Uh, um, and when I think about that journey of um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I mean, the, in, the, in this market, Rudy Miller's equal pay lawsuit, if any of you remember that, in the late 1980s, um, had a huge impact because of discovery. And um, it really did. I mean, it had a, a much of an equalizing impact. And uh, I, it, it's, it's an interesting time when you think about all of these things, like what does feminism mean today? Sometimes you just think, kind of take it for granted. Of course I'll be able to do that. Of course I'll be able to do, get you know, that, that job. Or of course people will like what I do. And that's not necessarily true. Um, but I sure hope and pray that the, the, the avenues for women are much more open and endless than they were um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and that what many of you said about kind of the positives coming out of the last two years is a good thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with people caring more about one another, for sure. All right, everybody. Thank you all for coming.